Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast, Episode 26, Sources in History, Gildas, Bede, and Ninius. So, we have three basic sources that we will be using in the Middle Ages. These are key sources for Welsh history because without them, we'd know almost nothing about Welsh history in this period. So, effectively, from more or less 500 to about 700, we would almost be completely vacant of information, or what little we would know would be completely down to small snippets of things that are found from external sources outside of Britain. So, let's start talking about them. Let's start with Gildas. Gildas is the first source within Britain. He is both the first native-born commentator and also one of the few commentaries that we can still read from that era. He himself seems to say that there was little literary done in his day. This absence may have been purposeful. It may have been because of destruction. It may have been because things were moved, as he argues. Or it could likely be that there just wasn't a lot of people writing about anything in those days. To scholars, he is the first point of access if you want to reach the era of late antiquity in Britain. His viewpoint is decidedly Christian, Roman, and to some extent millennial in nature. He is seeing in the rise of the pagan Anglo-Saxons a sign of the end of the world. He is, after all, not a historian. He is a preacher calling his flock to repentance, not trying to tell a straight-up story of history. He's trying to remind those who he sees as problematic that they need to straighten up and fly right or things will go wrong. And with that in mind, what do we actually really know about him? Well, as it turns out, not very much. And as I said last week, this is going to be a running theme. While there were writings for many years later which offer a history, they are at best framed within traditions. They're not necessarily the reality of his life. Some scholars believe that even the name Gildas is a pseudonym, as he wanted to protect himself from the monarchs he was complaining about. If you're going to throw shade at people in power, it's best to hide who you are. So if then we can only guess at what his name was, some thought a suggestion of Sileg as an option due to his use of puns and anagrams in the names of the kings of Britain. Because, of course, even when he's insulting the kings of Britain, he's not actually using their names. He's just using descriptive terms. So... Thus, we get this idea that he may have done that with his own name. It is a common thing for people in the past to use, and even in present day, to use pseudonyms when they're writing something that's either embarrassing or could be something that's critical of those in power who may want him dead and or jailed. Uh, so those kind of things happen all the time. Anonymous is a good example in our day. And so Gildas may not have been wanting his name all over it just because of his connections to power. Thus, Gildas itself might not even be a real name. He was purported to be from North England or Southern Scotland. He was British in origin and had spent some time in Wales and was of some form of cleric. We don't think he was at least traditionally a monk. However, some sources will call him that. But yet he did seem to spend a lot of time writing and was highly literate. So he'd obviously been educated in something like a monastery. He would have had a basic understanding of Latin and Brythonic, and likely appears to have had a very good education, to the point where his Latin is flawless, according to those who understand it better than I do. Yet, it's hard to measure that between being a monk and being in a monastery with someone who had contact with kings and seemed to have the gossip from what kings were doing. So it would seem to be he was probably more likely a much more publicly oriented cleric, not held up in a monastery, but likely could have been a bishop or a priest and would then have reason to have contact with these men and would know a lot more about him. His birth date, like his name and birthplace, is also not clear. In his writings, he was said he was born 47 years after the British victory at Montbatten, known now as the legendary Arthenian battle site. We think that meant he wrote around 550 AD, but there's little to say for sure just because it's hard to fix Mount Baden to anything. <laughs> there, there's no actual obvious date. There's a lot of guesswork that gets involved with it. We can hazard a guess it's probably around 500 AD based on some things that went on in some of the outside sources. But we're not 100% certain because outside of Gildas, we don't really have a mention of Mount Baden by anyone before him or during his time period. So it's hard to know where or when that took place. 
The view of Gildas's writings is either one of two ideas. One, uh, it is obscure, wordy, and of not much value, or in the case of historian Charles O'Man, nonsense. As another option, he is an immensely important to understanding how Britons viewed themselves in the 6th century, and offers a window into the writings of church leaders of that period. Is he a historian? No. Is he giving us history? Uh, probably not. He's giving us a viewpoint. And we have to keep in mind that what he's writing is a polemic. It's not about creating a historical document to give us an idea of the story of Britain. It's a letter written to people who he perceives as being in the wrong and in sin, and thus needs to be corrected and needs to be dictated to. So it's a complaint letter, and some have called it a wacky complaint letter, but the reality of it is it's probably not uncommon for the age. If you think about it, if you're culture and civilization is in upheaval with the amount of change that's happened within 150 years for Britain. It would have been heartrending for people to see the way things have gone, how badly everything is at this point compared to what it had been perceived. And remember, people always think of the past as somehow being better than the present. There is a constant idea that, well, back in the old days, you know, we had it hard. Uh, the old days were more difficult. The old days, or they look back at it with fondness as in the golden age. And in this case with Gildas, he kind of does both. He talks about how things were destroyed and how the people have been put to the sword and things have gone poorly. But at the same time, he talks about the period around Monbadan, for example, as being very much a golden age, an age of peace that was basically frittered away by these current kings. And we're going to get into a lot more detail as we talk about this era. But understand that this guy's trying to be the next Jeremiah. He's trying to have his own lamentations toward his people to make them stop in his own viewpoint from falling away from the proper gospel and to actually start following what Christ has told them in his viewpoint. And so his lecture is not to be taken word for word as history, but it is to be understood as what it is. And within that, see the history that is there, because there definitely is history there. There are things that are important. There are things we can take from it. Probably one of the biggest things we can take from it is the idea that there's still a Romanized sense for some Britons, and that the ideas and conflicts that began in Roman Britain likely began around the idea of being British and being Roman, and depending on which side you were on, depended on what you did and when the Romans left. And Gildas is not a defender of the British. He seems to be a defender of the Romans. And so thus, his viewpoint, his experience, and his understanding, he glories the Roman ideals, which again would make sense based on the church and based on his understandings of the education he probably received. He would see that the Roman education system developed people who were quite different from the people who were in Britain at the time. And he may have a very different understanding about what the glory days were like. So his viewpoint is important, but yet, as I said, we have to put it in context. And as long as we do that with every source, we will get to what we want, which is a historical point of view. But if we get caught up into the idea that he's just purely a storyteller, then it's harder to wean from him what we need to. And the reality of it is, everybody after him, even important writers who are highly respected will need Gildas to get there, and they will use Gildas to get there. Gildas's description of how the Anglo-Saxons come to the island is used and is believed for the better part of 1400 years. It's become the perceived obvious way that the Anglo-Saxons got there. There wasn't the archaeology to sort of poke holes in his argument. So people believed this for a very long time. Even his opponents believed it. So in a way, his history has outlasted his supposed usefulness, and we still translate everything within his ideas and his statements. The next source we're going to talk about is Bede. Bede is an incredibly important person in understanding the history of late antiquity and the early medieval period. Uh, Bede was a monk from Jarrow, which is in the northeast of England. Jarrow itself is best known for the sack of it by the Vikings later on, but at this point in time in the 700s, Bede is coming into his own in a, what was then a very powerful kingdom of Northumbria. And he is our best known and best understood of all of the early medieval sources we have from England. We know his life, we know his basic background, and when he wrote his document, which is far better than the other sources. But yet even at that, that doesn't necessarily mean he's completely understandable and completely well known. Um, his writings 
are similar in scope to the classical historians, and in how he reports things and his collection of writings show an early understanding of gaining a large body of material to work from. In other words, he wasn't just writing a polemic. He actually gathered information. He gathered sources in order to give his history of the English people, or better known as the ecclesiastical history of the English people. Unlike Gildas, who did not talk about his life in any detail, we have much more knowledge about the life and activities of Bede because he wrote about them, amongst others. He was either born in 672 or 673, and as a young man or a boy, he was given to monastic life at Jero. He was trained as a monk and would be educated by the church. He was another highly literate scholar, this time in Northumbria, the rather chaotic kingdom, but at this point at the height of its power in Anglo-Saxon England. He would die in 735, and his penultimate work, as I said, was the Ecclesiastical History of the English People, which was written around 731. And this is obviously later in his life, and the document is so important to how we understand the Middle Ages, and especially the early Middle Ages. It, it can't be understated. I had professors that talked about how he was the first historian of England. There's a lot of ideas about what he is and what he isn't, and we're going to get a little bit into it. Bede, as I said, was honored by scholars unlike Gildas. Though Bede leaned heavily on Gildas to understand early settlement, he actually is one of the ones who continues, and because of the respect he has, his ideas expressed from Gildas about how the Anglo-Saxons got to England becomes the norm all because of him, not because of Gildas. Bede also picked up on Gildas' ideas about the British and wrote about them as being lazy backsliders who needed the Romans to civilize them. He was obviously convinced by Gildas' writings about this idea, and that doesn't just come from Gildas, too. He was also affected by his own life, just as Gildas was, so his attitudes can't be taken as anything but bias. You know, he's an Englishman who has a country that's been fighting with the British and slash Welsh for hundreds of years at this point, and there very much is a nationalistic quality about his writing, so you can't accept what he's saying at face value either because of that particular problem. This is not a criticism, rather it's like an acknowledgement that Bede was looking to prove a point. In a way, it is fair to compare his writings to Tacitus. He writes something both interesting and well, but his agenda is rife throughout the document. For Tacitus, it was the Roman decadence and imperial life was bad. See those British people? They're worse off now as members of Rome than they were fighting her. Freedom over safety, in other words. Bede, on the other hand, was writing about a hundred years of wars with the British and the Saxons. The Welsh Kingdom of Gwyneth apparently had ransacked and raped Northumbria, according to Bede. In other words, there was no love loss between the British and the English in this day. So he chose all of the things that made them seem awful, wicked, and wrong, or stupid. Even success for the British was given to others. The Romans, the Picts, the Saxons. So for Bede... We're not talking about someone who's got an idea of a proper English history that's going to have a understanding and acceptance that there's bias and to deal with it and to present things as evenly as possible. He's presenting a history that is English, and thus it mixes legend, it mixes understandings about who people are, and it tries to make a point that, like I said, clearly is bent around his own objective, which is to give the English people a sense of themselves but also to offer an example of what not to do. And in this case, it's the Britons. You know, he describes them as being backward and barbarian without the Romans. And then once the Romans left, they fell back into their lazy backslider, unable to keep up with the Christian faith. He goes on and on and on about this idea. And, and we'll get into some of it because some of it has some historical actual evidence. But at the same time, keep in mind his writings are bent around the idea that he's presenting an English point of view. So he's you know, everything the British do is wrong and everything the English do is right, except for when it's obvious it's wrong. And if it's wrong, it's because they're going against God, who's the real right in all of this. So as much as I know scholars respect and honor him, I think we need to understand that within him, you can't look at him as being the end-all be-all of our sources. He is a major source. There is no doubt about it. You cannot talk about this period without using Bede. His understanding and his knowledge, as well as the access he had to documents, is probably unparalleled for writers at this point. So we have to use him and we have to go to him for help when we're trying to get a peek into what's going on. But that doesn't mean we accept everything he's saying without understanding 
where he's coming from. And like I said, there's nothing wrong with that, and it doesn't make him a bad source. It just makes him a source that we have to take with a grain of salt, much like we do Gildas, and much like we do the next person I want to talk about, which is Nennius. Nennius is kind of the yin to uh, Bee's yang. Not in the fact that he's considered more another historically good writer. He's not. In fact, I think most people outside of specific Arthurian types don't consider him as overly reliable. It appears that, at least in some of his writings, he's taking legends and mythological ideas and tying them into history, which was pretty common at that time. He's writing in the 9th century. It's one of the key historical documents that we have from the Welsh perspective, and is one of the few that we have from the Welsh perspective. It's really hard to find Welsh sources, which is why these three men are so important to us. And his writings about the history of Britain are based on partially evidence, partially history, but also partially, problematically, legendary sources. Nennius is probably both the most elusive and controversial of our group. If Gildas was not a brilliant source, at least he was near to his subject. Nennius is just as untrustworthy in the eyes of most, mainly because of how he offers, how much he offers, not how little. Suddenly, we get Arthur. We get fantastic stories about legendary kings and heroes of the age. Yet, at that same moment, clarity creates confusion. Are these histories, oral traditions, or myths? We don't know. And unfortunately, because of that, we actually have no clue as to how reliable we can consider anything he's written. And who really, unfortunately, was Nennius? No one can actually positively answer the question. We know What we find, and when paired with the other two sources, we must make the best we can through them as part of the story. We're stuck with him. So because of that, we have to accept him as a source. We have to understand, though, that much like the other two, and in this case, maybe even worse, his sources may not be great. He claims to have a lot of sources, and he may have been pulling from a lot of sources. There's evidence that he pulled from Irish and English and from Latin and from Welsh sources. But the problem is, is are these sources reliable? Was he just getting oral stories that were written down, which, much like Chinese whispers, can change over time? Does he have evidence that the others don't? Is that why his stories are clear? Or is it unfortunately more likely that as we get a clearer and clearer picture of things, it's actually more likely to be more and more muddled and more and more mixed with story, legend, and actual fiction than proper history? Again, we're stuck with him, so we have to use him. He is a reliable source in the fact that there is within him some history. If we take Gildas with a grain of salt, if we take Bede with a grain of salt, we have to take Ninius at points with a boulder of salt, but we will do what we can with him because he is key to our understanding of especially the Welsh perspective. He's one of the few that writes about it from the Welsh point of view, and we need him to make a more whole opinion. I think it's very dangerous not to use him as a source because if you do that, if you rely strictly on Bede and on English sources, you don't get a full picture of the opinions, even of in the 8th century and 9th century about what's going on. Yes, we may not get a clear view of late antiquity or the very earliest parts of the Middle Ages, but we do get a viewpoint, at least from North Wales, of how things were viewed and what stories were dictating their ideas and opinions. And I think that's important too, even if these stories aren't completely trustworthy. We'll run into this, unfortunately, even more so with Geoffrey of Monmouth, who's constantly derided as being a liar, even by people in his own age, because the book he puts together on the history of the British kings is fabrication mixed with legend in a lot of cases, and where it's history, it's like the story of the singer who anything that they sing that is original isn't good, and anything that's good isn't original. And that's a bit of the case with both Joffrey and, in some ways, Ninius. Anything that seems very, very unique is probably because they've gotten it from either their own brain or from a legend that was given to them. And so we can't necessarily accept what they're saying at face value, and in some cases have to completely withdraw from those arguments. And one of those figures is going to be Arthur. We're going to have a lot of problems with Arthur, and we are going to talk about him. As I've said, and I keep saying, we're not going to avoid him because you can't. He is he is within the Welsh history structure an important figure. The problem is he appears to be something that a lot of people take for granted isn't true. And we'll have to work our way through that, and we will talk more in depth about him later. 
The other thing we have to understand is with Ninius, he is Welsh, like I said. He's based in the kingdom of Gwyneth and may have been a linguist. So he, as he seems to have knowledge of Welsh, Latin, Old English, and possibly even Old Irish based on his source material. Each of these authors, however, are religious men from Christianity each with nationalistic and religious biases which determined what they offered in information. They will be the lens we will have to look through to understand the world we are entering, and each, in their own flawed way, give us insight in what comes after. As a Welsh history podcast, we can't simply ignore Gildas or Ninius to pin our hopes on a golden-haired northerner. We need to read them. We need to take from them as much as we can, because without them, Bede is a lone and very biased source in the wilderness, and we need more than just him to help us understand what is to come. Because at the end of the day, the diverging path of the Welsh, away from their Roman and British roots for that matter, will diverge, and these people help us understand why they're diverging, and help us understand what stories they're telling themselves to diverge, and how that will determine them in later life. I think we owe a debt of gratitude to them for keeping these writings and for those that actually held on to them, because they do at least give us a view which we wouldn't have at all otherwise. You know, think about the 5th century and how little information we have. We have snippets and lines of sources. Now we have books, and it gives us a chance to at least come up with ideas based on this and the archaeology about what was going on that we never would have had otherwise. I mean, think about the early history of Roman Britain, when we had Tacitus, Suetonius, and Dio, we had three authors, two of which we weren't sure about, and the other one we knew had a bias, but yet we used them because they were our only sources and they gave us a great window into what was going on amongst the Welsh and the British at the time. This will be the same with these three authors. They are incredibly important to us in understanding what's going forward from the 6th century onward in Britain. And more importantly, they give us a window inside of the Welsh mind, the Welsh way of understanding things, and how the Welsh go from being a Romanized British or group to being a British group to being what we now term as Welsh and a separate nation from the English. And how that happens is best understood by using as broad of a category of sources as we can. So we will rely upon these guys we will use them as much as we can, and we'll always put them in context of what their bias is, what the sources are saying, versus what probably actually happened, as we've done in the past, as we'll continue to do. And as we go into the medieval period, I hope you'll join us next week as we start to talk about religion in Britain. Until then, take care. I just wanted to remind everybody this is the last chance for me to do so. Our live stream goes on next week. So next Saturday will be the chance to watch us make ding-dongs of ourselves as we uh, carry on and play some games, both board, video, and RPG games. I hope you'll join us. Where you can find it is at twitch.tv forward slash distractions media. We're starting on December 3rd from noon Eastern time in the United States and Canada. So that would be for those of you in Britain, we're starting at about 5 o'clock in the evening, and we'll go to 5 o'clock the next day in British time. So we got 24 hours of us doing this stuff. Please come along and support us. It's a lot of fun. Please donate, as we need all the help we can get. And with your help, we can assist the children in need. And finally, I just wanted to thank everybody for their comments, their questions, and their advice for me. I have very much appreciated the help you guys have been. I continue to look forward to your commentary and your questions and anything you need to ask me, and you can do that at British History Podcast at gmail.com. And thanks, everyone. We'll see you later. Bye bye. This has been a Distractions Media production. For more information, you can check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com.